<clears throat> Hi, Beth. Hi, Amy. <laughs> Um, would it be possible for me to go ahead and get my shared screen up because I would actually like to start with it up? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Let's do that. So let's try that and see. Hello, everybody else. <laughs> I did. <Yeah, that's> you also. <laughs> okay. Yes, I do. Thank you. Um. I'm going to try to put there, try to put that on the screen. <clears throat> I'm very happy to have Beth Riggle Doherty joining us today as our final plenary speaker. Beth Riggle Doherty retired in 2020 from Otterbein University as Professor Emerita, where she received a Distinguished Teacher Award in 2002. For 36 years, Beth taught writing, Appalachian, and Native American literatures in general education courses and English courses in modern British, Latin American, and Appalachian literature, along with an occasional Virginia Woolf seminar. She earned a BA from Mount Union College and a PhD from Rice University, close by me here in Houston, Texas. Co-editor with Mary Beth Pringle of the MLA volume on teaching to the lighthouse, Beth edited How Should One Read a Book, Holograph Draft, and a fan letter collection for Wolf Studies Annual. Other publications and reviews on Wolf have appeared in journals, the miscellany, and selected papers volumes. Along with numerous Wolf presentations, she has also presented on her scholarship of teaching and learning research into college student reading. Her Virginia Woolf's Apprenticeship, Becoming an Essayist, is available for pre-order from Edinburgh University Press. And she is currently working on its sequel, Virginia Woolf's Essays, Being a Teacher. Thank you so much, Beth. Well, I feel so honored to be with all you all today. And thank you, Amy for asking me and for this marvelous conference where we see old friends and meet new ones. And thank you all for being here on the conference's last day, exhausted as you must be from the intellectual and emotional fireworks of our time together. I use the pronoun she, her, hers, and I speak to you from lands the Delaware, Mingo, and Shawnee, among others, once called home. I am grateful for the editorial and scholarly work of Andrew McNeely and Stuart Clark, the often lonely work of early Wolf scholars, and the more recent work of Leela Brosnan, Elena Guattieri, Jean DeBino, Beth Rosenberg, Randy Salomon, Anna Snythe, Melba Cuddy Keen, Anne Fernald, Ben Hagen, and so, so many others, right up to and including conference speakers, Michael Hart, Heather Milligan, Julia Dalloway, Pamela Cahey, Anna Knutson, and the archive presenters today. I wish I had had time to weave your insights into my talk, and I want all your papers. I want to especially thank Ben, Lacey, and Shiloh for their creative, inspiring presentation the other day. I am in awe. My talk today borrows some from my forthcoming book and a very rough draft of part of its sequel, but I also wrestle with the conference's theme. Although a room of one's own and three guineas loom large in any discussion of Wolf's pedagogy, I ask us to shift our gaze to other Wolf essays, to cut what is still too long and keep this plenary as close to a talk as possible. I do not indicate quotations or always use spoken attributions, but the print chat copy makes those clear. And I'm sorry, I use some block quotes. Finally, my PowerPoint slides do not follow my own instructions. They list essays I discuss along the way, which is rather boring. And in one spot, they provide evidence missing from the talk, but rapidly. So afterwards, I would be glad to go back to those. 
they are also in the chat. And here is a roadmap to my ramble today. And I'd like to begin that ramble with three stories. It was the summer of 1980. Gary and I were sitting in very high, very cheap Astrodome balcony seats, thanks to his work for a window company that had provided the unlikely perk of season tickets. A glorious, improbable summer filled with work on my dissertation by day and baseball games during the excitement of the pennant chase by night. Sitting behind us was a young boy, perhaps eight or nine years old, with his parents. Something about him seemed off. He talked loudly and almost constantly, cheered at strange times with pointless phrases, and punctuated his yells with frequent kicks to the back of my seat. Trying to focus on scoring the game, I turned to glare at him several times, and his parents tried to calm his odd, almost manic behavior. After one particularly impatient turn in my seat, accompanied by a stern scowl and loud exaggerated sigh, Gary leaned close and whispered, you know, if he were a character in something you were reading, you'd be nicer. In grad school at Rice University, <laughs> sitting around tables with students from Yale, Princeton, and Johns Hopkins, I was painfully aware of my Appalachian background and small Ohio college degree. What right did I have, a hillbilly? What right did I have to be there to write on Wolf's novels? Who did I think I was? At my lowest, I happened to cross the four volumes of the inaccurately named collected essays Leonard Wolf published in 1967 and read Wolf's essays straight through, one after another, as though they were a lifeline. Ever since, I now realize my work has attempted to figure out how, as Wolf wrote about authors and work new to me, she made me feel welcome. How, when I was feeling so alien in the academy because of what I did not know, did her essays beckon me in? How did she do that? Could I inch toward her stance in my classrooms, scholarship? Recently, I attended my 50th class reunion at Mount Union. Returning brought back many memories, but one didn't get pulled back into consciousness until my breakfast with an Otterbein alum on my way out of town. Let me back up. I was in college between 1968 and 1972, and Mount Union is only 30 miles away from Kent State. If you need to Google the context, go ahead. Although I was hardly a radical hippie, I sympathized with those who were, and I became a feminist then, putting a name to the frustration I had felt as a girl not allowed to play Little League. Jeans and tie-dyed t-shirts got me out of skirts, hose, garter belts, and blouses after all. Or after all, until designers got hold of them, jeans were comfortable and cheap. I remember suddenly realizing that makeup was another way the patriarchy not only kept women in constant anxiety about their appearance, but also kept money flowing into capitalist coffers. Funny how styles, colors, and in looks changed every four to six months, wasn't it? So I swore off it then and have worn it only rarely since. Again, hardly radical, and I never criticized other choices. I just had more money for books. Flash forward to spring 1987, when a panel of Otterbein women faculty and staff talked with sophomore women about how feminism informed our lives, and I shared that college epiphany. Flash forward again to my breakfast with Jessica, who had been at that gathering aimed at helping young women intentionally consider their choices. We caught up my retirement, her career changes, her family and mine, gardens, feminist worries. She showed me a picture of the daughter who had figured out how to attend the University of Barcelona on tuition exchange. And she said, you know, you are a presence in her life. How so, my puzzled face asked. Well, she curates her appearance, though consciously. She's grounded, but when much younger, she was stealing my makeup. So we talked, 
And I told her about this professor I had had who talked about the connection between the patriarchy and makeup. Every so often as she grew up, she would say, now who was that professor and what did she say? Virginia Woolf may have gravitated toward the essay because it allowed her to connect with readers directly and anonymously, but it also allowed her to wander on the page as she did in London or on the Downs. Further, as Chris Anderson argues, the essay is fundamentally democratic. It enfranchises both the reader and the writer. I suspect Wolf chose the essay as her second major genre, partly because of family heritage, even Julia tried her hand at it, partly because it provided entry into the literary world, but mainly because of its pedagogical value, what Scholes and Klaus call its inherent persuasive quality, attempt to tell the truth, more direct relationship between author and reader. Leonard Wolf noted the care with which she wrote and revised her essays, and the planning and thought behind her common readers, the pains she took to research and structure a room of one's own in three guineas, and the risks she took with the essay, all indicate deep engagement in the genre, and her desire to renew its traditions, experiment with its forms, and revitalize its aims. A groundbreaking modern novelist, Wolf was also a groundbreaking modern essayist. Essays allowed her to put on a public face, speak in a public voice, participate in public intellectual, literary, and social discussions, and have a stake in public cultural issues. And they allowed her to teach what and how she wanted. Virginia Woolf seldom states anything categorically, but she clearly dislikes preaching and overt moral pronouncements. In 1906-07, Virginia Stephen criticizes Canon Anger's lectures and essays because he relies on an anxious inquiry into the state of the writer's morals. Says Vincent Brown undertakes a crusade and insists upon a crucifix and a crucified in his novel, thus dangerously sacrificing much of natural human nature, much truth, and notes Mary Christie's pursuit of a moral theory harms otherwise lively essays with a high pitch of a scolding voice. In her 1922 essay, Eliza and Stern, she asks what standard biographers should use to judge the morals of the dead, by their subject's day, the biographer's day, or by some absolute standard of right and wrong by which the biographer can try Socrates and Shelley and Byron and Queen Victoria and Mr. Lloyd George. Eliza's biographers invite readers to assist at Eliza Draper's trial and debate her moral culpability at every point, she writes, when actually readers would be delighted to sit next to her at dinner. Literal truth-telling and finding fault with a culprit for his good are out of place in the essay, where the voice of the soul should never be heard she says in her 1922 Modern Essays Review. Wolf does not think much of us heavily furred and gowned authorities either, and she bristles at such authority combined with moral or literary certainty. Searching for a negative connotation, she often reaches for the teacher. Stephen Coleridge, for example, a poet, declares what the true function of the poet is and uses that standard to vigilantly guard the old, move his poets up and down like boys in a class, and drive intruders, contemporary poets, out with a birch in his hand. Or Margot Asquith, the prime minister's wife, makes her readers feel as though they are back in the nursery being sent into the corner or given marks for good behavior by a governess who scolds and praises and lays down the law. Indeed, this first class finishing governess thinks her province is not to reason, but to know, not to persuade, but to dictate. Wolf's metaphors arraign teachers for thinking they can choose our new poets for us or tell us what to think. 
Academics often also seem obsessed with picky scholarship labels and competition. Professor Witcher focuses too narrowly on the useless in his study of Eliza Haywood and Wolf's animus against him, whom she compares to an entomologist who pins a small housefly, a minor author, to the cardboard with a fine Latin name spreading far to the right and left of the miniature body, over 200 pages of critical commentary, spills over into an attack on Haywood herself. She was a writer of no importance, nobody reads her for pleasure, and nothing is known of her life. Wolf points out in The Anatomy of Fiction that whereas books teach you to think of them as very mixed, very distinct, very unlike one another, professors like Mr. Hamilton compulsively classify and cut literature to pieces, which are then named and numbered, divided and subdivided, and given their order or precedence like the internal um, organs of a frog. In Dr. Bentley, Wolf notes his biography forces upon us the extraordinary spectacle of men of learning and genius, of authority and divinity, brawling about Greek and Latin texts and calling each other names for all the world like bookies on a race course or washerwomen in a back street. In All About Books, she paints a frightening picture of what the young learn in the two great universities. Camp is opposed to camp. The hostile parties separate, form, meet, fight, leave each other for dead upon the ground, rise, form, and fight again. Writing to Hugh Walpole, she scorns those who sweep us all into separate schools, one hostile to the other, and thinks how horrified all the professors would be if we writers exchanged the cages we've been put in for a lark. University teachers do not fare much better than scholars. Wolf not only commented on the rights and wrongs of higher education in a room of one's own and three guineas, but also elsewhere in how it strikes a contemporary Wolf charges that teaching English literature kills it. Men of taste and learning and ability are forever lecturing the young and celebrating the dead. But the too frequent result of their able and industrious pens is the desiccation of the living tissues of literature into a network of little bones. In A Professor of Life, Wolf says Walter Raleigh, an Oxford English literature professor, made the undergraduates rock with laughter and go away loving something or other, most likely Walter Raleigh, not poetry or the art of letters, calling to mind her criticism of lecturing and why as an obsolete custom that incites the most debased of human passions, vanity, ostentation, self-assertion, and the desire to convert. Raleigh's letters reveal a man who cannot bear literature, cannot read Shakespeare anymore, becomes less and less attracted by writing at all, and practically ceases to read. Moreover, he comes to see admiration for writers' work as an emotion for spinsters and literature and occupation for old maids. Students and young writers, Wolf charges, in All About Books, take service under their teachers and instead of falling in love with words and learning their nature, how to mate them by one's own decree and sentences of one's own framing, have their marriages with literature arranged in public, tutors introduce the couples, lecturers supervise the amours, and examiners finally pronounce whether the fruit of the union is blessed or the reverse. Wolf sees the professor in the anatomy of fiction as a snake oil salesperson, treating fiction as a disease needing treatment and promising the young writer who takes the five pills, his review questions, and his nine suggestions for home treatment books will end up with fiction. Why teach English, she asks Julian Bell when he writes to her from China for advice about a modern British literature course he was frantically planning. All one can do is to herd books into groups and then these submissive young who are far too frightened and callow to have a bone in their backs, swallow it down and tie it up. And thus we get English literature into ABC, one, two, three, and lose all sense of what it's about. 
the wolf, all this passing of examinations in English literature, which led to all this writing about English literature, is bound in the end to be the death and burial of English literature. In all about books, Wolf wonders how knowing the whole course of English literature from one end to another serves the creation of English literature. Where is the straggler or deserter, the voice speaking from the heart, the love of language, music, imagery that's nurtured in private? Do we write better, read better, she asks in craftsmanship, than when we were unlectured, uncriticized, untaught? Significantly, as Melba Cuddy Keene has chronicled, Wolf criticized academics against the backdrop of a seismic shift, the establishment of English literature as a university discipline. At first associated with reform efforts to supplant the classics, English literature ultimately had to prove its rigor against those fighting for philology. To simplify greatly, for English literature to become a discipline, a hard, not soft option, its lower class traits, relevance, ties to the practical world, popularity, potential for pleasure, existence outside control, had to be repressed, and its upper class traits, aesthetics, detachment from life, difficulty, and potential for representing, constructing, and reinforcing mainstream culture had to be stressed. With the founding of the English Association, publication of the New Bolt Report and George Sampson's English for the English, and rise of I.A. Richards and F.R. Levis, the universities came to determine what place and value English literature should have what should be read and taught, and how, in the culture where she had fought to educate herself and gain public stature, Virginia Woolf's views about English literature had some weight, but in the university, she had no stature at all. Woolf's critiques Yes, <laughs> Wolf's critiques of institutions and academics ask us to consider our rationale for teaching and studying literature, our goals for doing so, our methods. What is the kind of education people ought to have, she asks in a draft letter to Ben Nicholson on August 24th, 1940. That is the problem we have got to solve. She did not feel responsible for changing education should that not be left to politicians? Yet reading, writing, teaching, and education preoccupy her as overt sec subjects in 16% of her essays, 103 out of 638, with a pedagogical subtext discernible in many others. Her essays explore and suggest the kind of education we might create or practice, something different from what the working classes, upper class males, and she herself had received, something available to all. For Wolf was a pedagogical essayist. She cared about education, teaching, learning, reading, and writing, and she modeled a pedagogy, one we might call ethical. Wolf most clearly articulates what an education should not be. In two women, she identifies the negative education that decrees not what you may do, but what you may not do, that discourages women, as Emily Davies noted, perhaps any marginalized group, by perpetually telling you that nothing much is ever expected of you. In Three Guineas, she says colleges should not teach the arts of dominating other people or the arts of ruling, of killing, of acquiring land and capital. But her occasional praise of scholars and teachers hint at what education could be. She applauds William Henry Hudson, an extension lecturer, for suppressing what she suspects is a background of extremely wide and serious reading rather than imposing it on readers. Thus, his treatment of literature is light and authoritative. She also praises Harold Williams, a devoted university extension lecturer, in caution and criticism. 
She knows his modern English writers would be better if he had tried to prove a theory or impute, impose a view of art, and she's sometimes surprised by his inclusion of books, which so far as we can see no more deserve description than the dandelions of the year before last. Yet she admires his impartiality, singular lack or disregard of personal preferences, and carefully balanced judgments, not deluding himself into believing many of his included poets and novelists are excellent, admitting most will be forgotten or interesting only to literary scholars. He doesn't aim to include the best or create hierarchies. Instead, he just puts it all in, and Wolf enjoys the honest point of view that does not force material into a pattern, but instead conveys literature as it is lived and produced during a time period, willy-nilly, chaotically, with no clear sense of who might last or not. Open-minded and fair, Williams listens to what the writers had to say, analyzes and compares, and then sums up their worth in phrases that even when censoring are generally moderately encouraging at the same time. And in 1903, Virginia Stephen called Miss Case an excellent teacher who taught well, forcing her to think more than I had done hitherto about the philosophical, religious, and pedagogical underpinning, underpinnings of the Greeks, about what they said to her. Plus, Case could be persuaded to compare Greek and English literature or listen to her revelations of all George's malefactions. In her 1937 obituary on the same page as Julian Bell's brief one, Virginia Woolf calls Janet Case a rare teacher and remarkable woman. Jean Mills traces Case's pedagogy to Jane Ellen Harrison, who used invitation, collaboration, and interaction to immerse students quickly in Greek plays. And Yopi Prenz notes the reading and discussion group Case and another student co-hosted in her Girton rooms. Wolf praises Case's ability to teach a wide variety of pupils, some who wanted to pass exams, other who wanted to read Greek for their own amusement. Her buoyant and unfettered spirit, sense of humor, and view of Greek as connected to many things, suffrage, maternity care, divorce law, home rule, probably explain, comments Wolf, why Case, who was both so sound a scholar and so fine and dignified a presence, never held an academic position. That scholarship, her Greek to English face, facing page translation of Prometheus Bound, appeared in the inexpensive pocket-sized Temple Dramatist series aimed at the working classes. Notably, these praiseworthy scholars and teachers exist outside the hierarchical university structure. Similarly, in a March 3rd, 1939 diary entry, Wolf describes a cheerful, free and easy class when she and Leonard visited a polytechnic to talk with students about their Orlando dust jacket designs and the publishing world. Better much than Oxford and Cambridge, not formidable. Likewise, in a 1918 review about a seemingly unlikely book club, young men not from Oxford or Cambridge in middle and lower class work, in a seemingly unlikely place, Bolton, that leads to a visit with Walt Whitman, the greatest ep epical figure in all literature, Wolf notes they learn he had no relish for a worship founded upon the illusion that he was somehow better or other than the mass of human beings, and discovered he was simpler, homelier, and more intimately related to them than they could have imagined. In her overtly pedagogical, how should one read a book and why, Wolf uses questions to outline a developmental process of learning to read and to suggest discussion-based classes. But seen through an, ed an educational lens, many of her essays give teaching advice. The value of laughter, laughing at the masculine spirit of solemnity, reminds us not to take ourselves and our knowledge too seriously. Old Hampshire vignettes suggest we might look at others, students, with a less judging eye as it asks the reader not to be a tourist with a crude eye 
and believe strangers who claim village dwellers are dull, apathetic, and lazy. Prompted by Walter Gerald, Thomas Hood's biographer, Stephen then reminds us to pay attention to the hubbub that once surged round the base, not just the pinnacles of accomplishment in literary history. What about the hundreds of Thomas Hoods filling columns satisfactorily, the circles of place, neighbors, and families rippling outward from Keats? Such considerations are not trivial, Stephen writes, not only because they affect things we are wont to look upon as isolated births, but also because ignoring them makes our judgment more than necessarily dry. On not knowing Greek, as Cuddy Keen and then Eve Sorum thoroughly demonstrate, acknowledges the not knowing inherent in learning and teaching, a recognition that aids rather than stymies. Wolf praises Oliver Goldsmith for his detached attitude and with the view as a citizen of the world, learning from experience how slight differences are between people and peoples. He insisted we should pull our discoveries and learn from each other. The censorship of books illuminates how fearful and thwarted writers and readers, teachers and students feel right now. Wolf suggests essays may blow more knowledge into us than the innumerable uh, chapters of a hundred textbooks in the modern essay, traces her reading process in on rereading novels, and lays out the dilemma our current chaos poses, not just for artists and writers, but for anyone who cares about teaching and the humanities and why art today follows politics. I'd like to look more closely at an essay not directly about education, but one published in a pedagogical context, Ruskin Looks Back on Life, which appeared in the popular magazine TP Weekly's Training in Literature series on December 3rd, 1927. The magazine aimed to bring to many thousands the love of letters and its frequent contributors included Shaw, Wells, Chesterton, and Bennett. The byline names Wolf as author of To the Lighthouse, and Andrew McNeely says it enhanced her essay with a Ruskin plate from the Seven Lamps of Architecture, two paragraphs from Preterita titled A Cameo of Pro Prose, and three subheadings. Wolf does not use all her pedagogical strategies in this essay. She does not foreground her location or position as in Three Guineas or Mr. Howell's on form, or overtly use questions or conversation as in Is Fiction an Art or Mr. Conrad at Conversation, or acknowledge cultural differences as in On Not Knowing Greek or the Russian Point of View. But she takes her readers seriously, assuming their interest, explores paradox, provides context, and uses detail and story, provides definition and summary, encourages access. The context assumes an assignment, and the reader can explore Ruskin further. Wolf begins by reassuring readers who might be daunted at the thought of reading Ruskin. They are not alone since the recently published abridgment of modern painters may prove people no longer have the time to read Ruskin in the mass, but also assuming readers do not want to let so great a writer recede from them, she proposes an alternative, a much slighter book containing a teaspoonful of Ruskin, the essence of those waters from which the many colored fountains of eloquence and exhortation sprang. Next, she recommends Preterita, suggesting readers approach Ruskin through his autobiography, provides his translation of the Latin title, and then openly offers the reader a choice along with an outline of both his book and her review. If anybody should wish to understand what sort of man Ruskin was, how he was brought up, how he came to hold the views he did, he will find it all indicated here. Also, if a reader wishes to feel for himself the true temper of Ruskin's genius, 
Preterita preserves it. Quickly summarizing facts about the obscurity of his birth and family background and showing us the boy sitting between his father and mother when they drove about England taking orders for Sherry, Wolf then sets up a conflict that afflicted Ruskin and that her essay will flesh out. He reverenced aristocracy and what it stood or should stand for but he reverenced still more the labors and virtues of the poor, to work hard and honestly, to be truthful in speech and thought, to make one's watch or one's table, as well as tables and watches can be made, to keep one's house clean and pay one's bills punctually, or qualities that won his enthusiastic respect. Wolf uses repetition to show this paradox pervading Ruskin's nature, the Puritan's austerity fought with the artist's, artist's sensuous susceptibility. Work, a passion for French cathedrals contended with his respect for suburban chapels, and style, opulent eloquence versus meticulous accuracy. She encourages empathy with her focus on Ruskin as a person and writer, describing the damage his parents did to his peace of mind when they isolated him and prevented him from learning social interaction skills, and then quoting a devastating passage. My judgment of right and wrong, Ruskin says, and power of independent action were entirely undeveloped because the bridal and blinkers were never taken off me. Thus, Ruskin was intellectually precocious and emotionally stunted, and not even nature could console him. Speculating, Wolf suggests the rant and fury and bitterness of Ruskin's books stems not just from his prophetic vision, but from the frustration of these contradictions. Hinting at her position, she writes, we cannot help guessing that had little John cut his knees and run wild like the rest of us, not only would he have been a happier man, but instead of the arrogant scolding and preaching of the big books, we should have more of the clarity and simplicity of Preterita. Ruskin is at peace with the world in it. He can at last write humorously, kindly, and observantly about his life and world. Readers can count on vivid portraits of his parents, a clear portrayal of the English middle class, and a generous in invitation into the privacy of Ruskin's own experience. Reminding right readers the work is unfinished, they will get only the pure and limpid spoonful of water Ruskin distilled from the stormy turmoil of his suffering. She tempts us to read nonetheless because the writing makes us want him to go on forever talking. Choosing to introduce Ruskin through work in which Ruskin chooses to reveal himself, Wolf stimulates empathy and curiosity. Anyone choosing to read more R R Ruskin will sense the person in his prose. What does Wolf's pedagogy as described here? this is my section on not knowing ethics, have to do with ethics. It occurred to me as I prepared this talk that I should just say, talk with Amy Smith, explore Jessica Berman and Elsa Hogberg, and read Anna Snythe, Melba Cuddy Keene, Madeline Detloff, and Ben Hagen. They can enlighten you much more than I, who regrets not taking philosophy in college. My philosophical ignorance is profound. A rudimentary grasp of the difference between Plato and Aristotle and bits and pieces of contextual knowledge about other philosophers picked up in grad school and over the years means that although I generally understand written philosophical articles about Wolf while reading them, I do not retain their arguments. Hearing epistemological or ontological, my brain freezes. Panic, not automatic meaning, follows. Ethics, in its philosophical sense, makes my mind skitter. And my last-minute crash course in ethics has not prepared me for this class, dear teachers. Still, perhaps exploring some eth questions about ethics as related to Wolf's essays would be worthwhile. So here goes. 
If Virginia Woolf is a pedagogical essayist whose pedagogy pervades her essays, what do those essays suggest about teaching and learning the education people ought to have? If the word ought suggests ethics, how weave her threads of guidance into an ethical fabric? If Wolf employs an ethical pedagogy, how might it inform and inspire our teaching? In the novels of George Meredith, Wolf criticizes him for calling attention to a philosophy that should not be separable from fiction. Philosophy is a view of life, she writes, that should be buried in one's flesh and blood, buried beyond the possibility of exhumation, not opinions that stick out from the body of the book. I'm still trying to dig up the philosophy of education buried in Wolf's essays, but some provisional ideas follow. Wolf thought it a crime to withhold education from anyone. Although some framework and context are necessary and aid learning, laying down laws inhibits it. So education should encourage the learners continuous creation of a rickety and ramshackle fabric open to revision by other readers, more reading, later generations. We can only approach knowing, not fully acquire it. Educators should trust and respect students with freedom and independence. Educators should not display superior learning, but learn with students. They should and simultaneously acknowledge learning is difficult with many barriers hindering it and recognize students are capable and can develop the skills to surmount such barriers. Education should ask, not coerce guide, not impose, widen, not narrow, create involvement, not detachment, create curiosity, not hardened opinions, set the imagination free, not repress it. Ultimately, it should give pleasure. In Wolf's philosophy of education, then, the learner should have access to an education in which she is free to work within a loose contextual framework to explore, gain partial knowledge, create evolving meaning, and build further context, and to do so with instructors who understand the difficulties of learning while believing in her capabilities aiming to free the learner's thought and imagination, to ask questions rather than provide ready main answers, and to provide room for growth, such an education ultimately promotes the ongoing pleasures of the learning process. This educational philosophy and pedagogy gleaned from Wolf's essays reflect an ethics described by Iris Murdoch in her work on the moral imagination. If I understand my conversations with Amy Smith and my reading of Madeleine Detloff, Ben Hagen, Melba Cully Keene, and Jessica Berman correctly, and their readings of other philosophers, the moral imagination involves a continuous effort to give others our just and loving attention. At the heart of that effort, which Murdoch captures in an imagined example of a woman's opinion of her son's wife, beat two others, the older woman's scrutinizing of herself and her resulting thought, let me look again. Reading that example immediately reminded me of Virginia Stevens' journal entry about Mrs. Wall, meeting and describing the woman keeping a lodging house for theological students in Wells in 1908. She writes, this is exactly what I had imagined of Mrs. Wall, but also says she deserves a little closer attention which does not turn Mrs. Wall into a different person, but does make her a subtler study than I expected, a woman of insight, tact, and shrewd wisdom, who unfortunately has no political or cultural power. 20 years later, Wolf notes that perhaps because Meredith rouses these antipathies, we are a little more anxious than usual to cross-examine our impressions. Wolf's attempts to look again permeate her rhetorical strategies, the turn and turnabout method that Cuddy Keene names and describes as the trope of the twist, and infuse her style and tone as Teresa Winterhalter shows in her Three Guineas analysis. Julia Briggs puts it this way, 
For Wolf, the process of reading, whether people or texts, had no natural terminus. It was one of continuous invitation, progression, correction, and recorrection that lasted as long as life itself. That process suffuses her essays too. Again, if I understand what Iris Murdoch says, the moral imagination means a willingness to sit with and in contradictions and tensions, to sit with and in unknowing or unmastery, as Eve Sorum puts it, to examine one's point of view and what forms it, to make oneself vulnerable by identifying one's flaws, to sit with and in the slow, endless task of attempting to see clearly, to sit with and in one's own multiple and contradictory selves and acknowledge the same multiplicity in others, to bring that self to one's relationships and work, to aim for and increase one's capacity to do these things while making it possible for others to increase their capacity. Such an ethics is active and interactive, even if often internal, because it ultimately affects one's relationships with others and the external world. Madeline Detloff maintains Wolf has and will have value for readers and writers, students and teachers, because she left us the example of her practice. Sina Quaris's new book, Rooms, Women Writing Wolf, arrived a few days ago, and I dipped into it. She affirms Detloff's belief, describing Wolf as being monumental in my mind, as well as my daily familiar pedagogue, before being chastened by Wolf's sentences compared to her own, and exhilarated by the public outgoing Wolf she discovered as she spent a winter month in a library pulling down one large bound edition of the Times Literary Supplement after another, leaning against a shelf in the stacks and reading them. Ever since, Karas has worked to unravel this new mystery of Wolf in the mode of critic and ensure women's writing in all its complexity appears in the most mainstream sources. Wolf displays, portrays, models, uses, does what Amy calls the moral discipline of delaying final judgment. She does not fear, fear using perhaps or scenes. She often asks questions, 17 in street haunting, to guide, reveal process, invite participation, consider another person's way of seeing, such as the startling, what then is it like to be a dwarf? She frequently begins sentences or paragraphs with but or yet to signal yet another possibility, at least 14 in Mon Ten, but still counting. Wolf evaluates, giving just loving attention does not preclude eventual judgment. But if we attend to her practice, we realize that evaluations or conclusions remain provisional because her efforts to hold off or complicate final judgment imply further adjustments could be made by her, more reading, us, and thus implicitly invite readers to continue the process after reading. What we and students often call contradictions or ambivalence in Wolf may, in fact, reflect an ethical resistance to certainty and exhortation, traits she associates with authoritarians in home, nation, and world. Her deferrals may be an attempt to see clearly, to look again at her own seeing. So, for example, while Wolf strives for some unity and completeness in Byron and Mr. Briggs, a 1922 draft essay that reveals her working out her ideas about the common reader and lets us see a writer preparing to write a review, not writing one, she lets fragments and contradictions stand, leaving the essay unfinished, which nourishes her eventual portrayal of the common reader as someone seeking to create a whole, but perfectly happy in the meantime with that rickety and ramshackle fabric made of hasty, inaccurate, and superficial scraps. 
Being part of a ragamuffin group of worst educated and less gifted readers whose constantly changing and evolving ideas and opinions might contribute to the final distribution of poetical honors sounds satisfying. It turns out writers and readers depend on each other. And liking Maisie Dobbs mysteries might deepen my understanding of the Great War and Mrs. Dalloway. The attention Wolf Murdoch, excuse me, the attention Murdoch describes. But if we consider what the work of attention is like, how continuously it goes on, and how imperceptibly it builds up structures of value around us, we shall not be surprised that at crucial moments of choice, most of the business of choosing is already over. This does not imply that we are not free, certainly not but it implies that the exercise of our freedom is a small piecemeal business, which goes on all the time and not a grandiose leaping about unimpeded at important moments. The moral life on this view is something that goes on continually, not something that is switched off in between the occurrence of explicit moral choices. What happens between such choices is indeed what is crucial. Of course, psychic energy flows and more readily flows into building up convincingly coherent but false pictures of the world complete with systematic vocabulary. Attention is the effort to counteract such states of illusion. The attention Murdoch describes could describe education, could it not? The essay, Wolf's Classroom seems particularly suited for this kind of attention, a form that inherently proposes, complicates, tests different angles and possibilities, refuses to settle questions once and for all, accrues new insights as it perambulates, captures what's at stake, does not offer firm resolutions. A form allowing for just and loving attention and small moral acts. Near the end of street haunting, before the narrator circles back to where she began, but with a difference, she walks into a stationer's shop, describing it as an adventure, because the lives and characters of its owners have distilled their atmosphere into it. But she immediately realizes the couple there had been quarreling, their anger shot through the air. The woman goes to the back room and the man distractedly tries to wait on the narrator, telling a story about a legal gentleman who had gotten into trouble owing to the conduct of his wife. Finally, exasperated, he roughly calls out, where do you keep the pencils? As if his wife had hidden them. She comes in, studiously looks at nobody and puts her hand immediately on the right box. And the narrator imagines the man thinking, how then could he do without her? But then comes the extraordinary, perhaps moral moment. The narrator thinks and acts. In order to keep them there, standing side by side in forced neutrality, one had to be particular in one's choice of pencils. This was too soft, this, that too hard. They stood silently looking on. The longer they stood there, the calmer there they grew. Their heat was going down, their anger disappearing. Now, without a word said on either side, the quarrel was made up. She would get out her sewing, he would read his newspaper, the canary would scatter them impartially with seed. The quarrel was over. A small, imperceptible act. We already know about Wolf's request in Three Guineas to remain outsiders as we work inside our professions. But what do other Wolf essays and their ethical pedagogy ask of us? Her critiques asked us to consider our rationale for teaching literature. What are we about? Our goals for doing so. So what do we most want students to learn? Our methods, how? And her essays asked us to care about the reading and writing of literature, the conditions required for reading and writing it, the love of it. 
but our institutional disciplines demand and thus define something else, the knowledge of a canon, methods for mastering it, and products that demonstrate mastery and can be measured. Students gain credentials that show they have done what the discipline requires. Faculty who were once students also earned credentials and continue to earn them, markers of disciplinary approval, which of course I had done. So how, she asks, might we keep the creation and renewal of literature at the center and yet survive in the academy? How sustain our love for literature, build our students' love for it in our professional lives? If the relationship between teacher and student is analogous to that between writer and reader in Wolf's essays, which I think it is, then teachers must consider the students they teach, establish trusting and respectful relationships with them, and help create personas for students that those students can grow into and occupy, just as Wolf creates personas for readers that her readers can in fact become. Such a task relates, I think, to Murdoch's suggestion to look again, to reimagine as students, especially those thoroughly trained by their educations, to resist efforts to reach their curious or open selves. What would curricula, courses, assignments look like if we aim to cultivate the habits of mind Jose Medina identifies and Madeline Detloff suggests, knowledge, humility, curiosity, and diligence, open-mindedness? How might we cultivate a willingness to sit with and in our multiple and contradictory selves and allow students the same privilege, reminding them and ourselves that thoughts, feelings, statements, beliefs can be looked at again, can change and change again. Wolf claims in John Ruskin Looks Back on Life that his life, the inner conflicts harrowing it, had everything to do with he wrote. With, with what he wrote. She ends her essay with that insight. He was a prophet once and had suffered greatly. Might learning about writers' humanity, flaws, and struggles illuminate their work? How might that recognition change what we read by and about authors? Might such study help us give more just and loving attention to authors, to seeing, as Walt Wolf often does, that strengths are wed to flaws, might such study help us give such attention to others, to ourselves? As Parker Palmer says, we teach who we are. All we can bring our work to our work is ourselves, but we too are flawed, make mistakes, struggle, suffer. Struggles to act ethically inform our teacher, teaching. How could it be otherwise? Teaching requires constant choices, course titles, catalog descriptions, readings, structures, assignments, assessment, class plans, or not, questions, classroom etiquette, right down to responding to this student in this class at this moment. All of it. No wonder this incremental constant paying attention wears us out. Yet we, yet that is what Murdoch asks of us, and we know most of our teaching failures stem from not paying attention, or not enough. Wolf's philosophy of education and pedagogy challenge us to rethink curriculum change pedagogy. Yet with the street haunting scene in mind, perhaps one might start with small, almost imperceptible changes rather than a grandiose overhaul. Like starting class by saying, I was thinking about what Carl said all the way home Tuesday night, and I wonder if Student shock told me it had never occurred to them to continue thinking about discussions beyond class or imagine that I did so or see connections between class sessions. What small actions might build trust, help students bring their selves to the task when that's the last thing they want to do and not always because they're unprepared? What small actions might encourage looking again? What might we do to help ourselves and our students live with ambiguity and paradox while striving for clarity and ethical choice? Might we focus more on asking questions and realizing that some cannot be answered or answered yet or answered only in muddled human complex ways? Our efforts to use an ethical pedagogy that resists patriarchal methods can fail 
or frustrate, as Cuddy Keen shows in her analysis of Wolf's The Plumage Bill and uh, Wolf's ensuing exchange with H.W. Massingham, or as Deborah Wilson shows in her attempt to use a more adventurous, adventurous curriculum and liberating pedagogy. What if readers miss an essayist's ethical stance or point? What if a student is sure you are without question the most ill-read, poorly prepared professor he had ever met? But Wolf's practice and persistence encourage us to keep learning about student cognitive development, dipping into advice from a Mary Ellen Weimer or Therese Houston, consulting Apollo Freire or Bell Hooks, who points out that in the transformed classroom, there's often a much neater, need, greater need to explain philosophy, strategy, intent, finding support in a Ben Hagen or Madeline Detloff, and to keep reading Wolf's essays. Gary was right about my, my reaction to the boy kicking my seat, though in my defense, literature gives us glimpses of inner worlds that life does not. But that's the point, isn't it? Beyond reading literature to understand those different from me, I needed to use my way of reading literature to read a person which Pamela Cauley discussed Thursday. I needed, as Murdoch suggests, to look again. Years later, I had the chance to do that when students on the autism, autism spectrum were in my classes. Society had learned more, as had I, and I tried to put what I had learned into practice. One young man, brilliant at gaming, worked hard to fit in enough to take to fit in enough to take courses, complete his work, and get his degree, which he did. In our class, though, whenever I mentioned authors or books not on the syllabus, he habitually interjected, never heard of him. After the hundredth repetition of that phrase, I burst out, well, that's not a commentary on them. Immediately ashamed of my commentary, I felt something shift in the classroom after that, but oddly enough, positively. Perhaps he perceives something about himself, classroom interactions, responsibility for learning. He still felt free to contribute and did. His classmates treated him well, but sometimes pushed back and we carried on. Still, I wish I had found a kinder way to establish the boundary. Buying those four multicolored volumes of Wolf's essays in Brazos bookstore and then reading them in one huge gulp changed me. They changed my scholarly path and continue to nurture it. Eventually, they changed my teaching. Taking Wolf seriously, taking her practice seriously meant for me rethinking classroom goals, rethinking how students might reach those goals, rethinking readers, readings, assignments, activities, assessment, not all at once and not all successful, difficult within an educational system opposed to much of what Wolf proposes, still worth the effort. And my patriarchy and makeup story is just plain funny, teaching me humility about my teaching and legacy. It will not be remotely close to what I hope it might be. What students remember will differ completely from what I'd like them to recall, and their learning may have nothing to do with my subject or my classes. The story I told long ago in that gathering for sophomore women also had no effect on their behavior. Still, perhaps, perhaps it encouraged asking and thinking about what cultural practices and pressures mean. Now, of course, a dozen other questions clamor to be asked about ethics and philosophy and education and classrooms and lectures and students, but mercifully, time's up, silence. Let's all unmute ourselves and clap. <laughs> yes. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah, oh, <laughs> Bravo. I think you've destroyed. I think you've destroyed each and every one of us in this room in the most beautiful way. Uh, <laughs>
we're standing, Beth. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Beth, wait till you see the chat. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry I went on too long. <laughs> oh, that's not possible. <laughs> you, you did could... not go on too long. Start over. <laughs> yeah, you, could, you could keep going. There are several really? people who have said I could listen to Beth all day. Oh, oh no. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah, oh, yes. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. You've used up all the, the emojis. <laughs> <laughs> true. <laughs> it's true, not a dry house, a dry eye in the house. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, you must save me the chat, Amy. I will. But we will. I was kind of focused on clicking through. and Didn't even have it up. Yeah. I will save it for you. So... What would people like to ask? Everything. <laughs> uh, How did you do that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I don't know. Well, I think Ellen the wisdom has... comes with teaching what? the essays. <laughs> Yes, teaching the essays, teaching uh, the works, you know, teaching. It comes out of the classroom. Yeah. You know, I started, um, I, I don't know what year I started doing this, but I started <clears throat> using How Should One Read a Book at the opening of almost every class I taught. It didn't matter whether it was general ed or literature or whatever. And um, and I would always say, you know, the, the middle, don't worry about it, don't get bogged down, just keep going, <laughs> you know. And um, we would we would talk about it. We would talk, we would talk about, you know, what surprised them about her advice and uh, what some of that advice was. And and they were always shocked by um, not having to be critical right away. They, they were always shocked by that and, and kind of liked that. And so, um, but then, um, you know, we would, we would have the class and then at the end of the quarter or semester after we switched, I would have them read it again after they had read lots of things in class. Um, and that was always an interesting di discussion, yeah. I think maybe there might be some, some yeah. questions. Looks yeah. like Ellen, Ellen Moody, would you like to go ahead and start? It's very, it was very enjoyable. And when I was very young, I remember loving um, her essays very much and actually preferring them to the fiction. Uh, it's been a long time. I mean, I'm old too. <laughs> and I've been teaching since 1972 and things change a lot over the years that I started teaching in college. Um, what I was thinking is, uh, I hope you don't find this depressing. <laughs> is in the last number of years, well before the pandemic, began the closing of humanities departments across the United States. There's a large percentage, I, I don't have it in front of me, but there's yeah. a large percentage of colleges that have, never mind get rid of tenure, never mind having yeah. everybody as adjuncts, just close yeah. the whole department, period. Yep. And uh, in the last number of years since the pandemic, there's been a terrific shrinkage in the number of people going to community colleges altogether. The price partly being so high of, right. the, of the, you know, you might say when you go to church, everybody there is just doing a ritual and who thinks of what they're doing, they're there to see their neighbors. But if you don't go to church in the first place, you may never think of religion. <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, uh, I don't know if you want to speak to what, what she might have responded to this tremendous close down and shut down of a discipline when I first started, maybe not have been a good idea, but when I first was an English major, we had to read the first two, we had to read two volumes of the Norton. Maybe that was a bad idea, but we did cross the two Nortons and we did actually have some idea that English literature was this discipline made up of these particular things. Mm -hmm. And you had some, and now you don't need to do that at all. Uh, you can, you can uh, major in whatever you want, no matter how narrow it is or whatever. What do you think? I, um, I put before you just as, as what would she say or what do you want to say of this business of huge numbers of departments closing down, humanities altogether, shrinkage of the community colleges. 
I don't know what the situation is in England, but when I talk to friends who teach there, they talk about a lot of the demands being made on the teachers, pulling them right away yes. from anything real that you might want to teach. Right, right. It's really, tough. really loading people up, I think. Um, uh, and I, oh golly, I don't, I don't know the answer. I, I think, I think one of the things, um, I think one of the things we did, and this is very simplistic, so please forgive me, but I, I just remember thinking this at the time that, um, and there was a lot of pressure to do this, and I understood that pressure, but I remember thinking that when we began discussing uh, the study of English as being uh, necessary for careers, we were making mm -hmm. a mistake. <laughs> um, as I said, I, I know why we did that, but, but um, it's, it's put us into a box now. Um, and of course, this, this love for the creation of it and, and what many people at the conference have talked about how, uh, all art really sustains us and opens up more creativity, uh, especially when things are very dark. Um, it's very hard to articulate that in, in ways that um, help people understand the value <laughs> as Madeline has so uh, well put in her in her book, you know, how when other people are framing the discussion and when we participated in that framing of the discussion ourselves, then we're in kind of this box where we have to figure out how to reframe the discussion <laughs> and then explain within that. The only thing I can tell you that is at least a little bit hopeful is that I talked to the English department chair at Otterbein the other day and she said they have the largest class they've had in a long time, oh. the largest incoming class in a long time. And so I'm thinking, well, maybe, <laughs> I, I mean, I've always thought there's such a hunger out there. It's just, we don't know how to uh, talk about that hunger or how it relates to living a life rather than doing a job. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but I think the hunger is still there. Um, so that's not a very good answer, Ellen. <laughs> but I, I do. I'm, I'm really uh, hurting at the battle. So many people, so many of you, are fighting to just survive um, and to explain to people who don't, again, who don't understand the, the wider frame of literature, why it's important to study it, yeah. Claire, would you like to go ahead? Thank you so much, Beth. That was so beautiful. And I hope you will read the chat later to see how much we <laughs> have collectively been appreciating the immense beauty and depth of that talk. It was gorgeous. Um, I just want to ask you, I also kind of want to say how much your own ethics of participation in settings like these conferences is really visible to us and to, has been to me over the years. And I just, your presence is a kind of magic, Beth. So I just really appreciate everything that you do for us as a community here. Um, I want to ask you about coming to ethics. And so I really loved the way that you framed it about on not knowing ethics, right? And there's a kind of humility about the way that you approach yeah. it as something new for you, it which is. I think is really 
And I think that's so important, though, for us as teachers to sometimes put ourselves back in the students' shoes in this way it's to totally try something new, new and to yeah. take ourselves out of our maybe comfort zones of expertise that we have spent many years developing and try mm -hmm. a different mode of thinking. So I just would love to hear you reflect a little bit more on what that felt like for you today. <laughs> I cannot tell you how scared I was. Um, I mean, Amy was very encouraging. Um, and and oh, I was uh, tidying up in all sorts of ways the book that's coming out. And I basically had, I ended up with three weeks. And I thought, well, and of course I had ordered all these books and I had all these articles and I thought, well, I cannot, <laughs> there's no way I can do this, you know? Um, and I started, I mean, quite literally, I started reading Madeline's book at night before I fell asleep and it was just so inspiring because it put things in ways that I could understand. <laughs> um, and it gave me new people. And then, of course, Amy had talked to me about Iris Murdoch, who I've not read. I've not read novels. I've read this one essay by her. Um, and I mean, I just, uh, it really was a crash course. And I really do recommend this book by, I think it's Teresa Houston on teaching what we don't know. Um, because she says often that's what happens. We get asked to teach things we don't know. We have to step in for somebody or, you know, <laughs> Uh, suddenly, we, we, um, but it, but it's very encouraging, I think. I mean, I, you know, <laughs> everybody kept saying, you're going to be fine. And I, and I, and I said to somebody, yeah, but in my head, I'm saying there's always the first time for falling flat on my face. And I think all of us feel like that in a classroom especially if we're doing something we don't know an awful lot about. Um, but I think it, it does help figure out how to work with students because they're in that position every day and they're entering all these other classes and feeling the same way in those classes too. And so, uh, I don't know, that's, I, it just, uh, it really was a crash course. Um, not a lot of sleep <laughs> recently. <laughs> it was beautiful, Beth, thank you. Thank you, Corey. Madeline, go ahead. Um, so Beth, that was just extraordinary. It was, mm -hmm. It, it's true that I don't think there was dry eye in the house. I can't uh -huh. see through the Zoom, but um, certainly not in my house. Um, I just wanted to, I had one quibble with you um, <laughs> that I put in the chat. Good. And that is, <laughs> you are a philosopher, Beth. I mean, I, I um, just need to say that as, you know, a philosopher, someone who thinks deeply and um, comes from the love of wisdom, right? The philosophia love of wisdom and and i can't thank you enough about uh for your practice right for you're always always being uh wise um and i mean this since uh, i first started this which was in 1997 i believe it was my first conference and um maybe even earlier than that and and also just always showing up um, and that's a that's a sort of practice of uh, just and loving vision that um, I think you you demonstrated here today, um, and uh, so you know you you did it, 
<laughs> and you have always been doing it. I mean, you've you've been doing it all this time. And um, you know, I I just can't thank you enough for the your example and for your generosity and for um, how you show us you know, how to live and what to do and, and how to teach through the example of your presence and, and your actions. Um, and um, that's all, um, it was my one little quibble uh, with you and I won't, it, it's really, it really um, matters. Uh, and thank you for everything that you, you do and bring to us, um, that's all. Ben. See if I can get through this without having to mute myself again. Um, so three things. One is um, that you've been a teacher to me long before I ever met you. Um, when I was looking around for who on earth writes, when I found out that Wolf had taught at Morley College, I started thinking, <laughs> I was so shocked and started looking around at who, who had written about this and your name kept coming up that you have been teaching us to take that seriously for a long time. And you were the voice on the page that I first read to sort of ask those questions. And as it turns out, you were also in the audience when I first gave a paper at this <laughs> conference. And I used the word pedagogy and you came up to me at the table. I had no idea who you were because I'd never met you, but I saw your name tag and I almost hit under the desk, <laughs> which I'm glad I didn't because as people here know that there was no reason to be worried. Um, you were very generous and I wanna thank you for that, um, both on the page and in person. Uh, I also wanna thank you. Um, I think you've helped correct something in my thinking about the pedagogy of Wolf's essays. Um, I think I make a dubious claim in, in, in my book that um, I learn less about the relational aspect of pedagogy from Wolf than I do from Lawrence. I learned a lot of other mm. things about pedagogy from Wolf, but yeah. not that. You, I think you've shown that I was wrong about that. And I, I wanna thank you for that. Um, it's something I'll go back and reconsider. Um, mm. Your reflections on how reading Wolf has brought you to ask questions about your relationship to your students and to ask questions about them in ways uh, that I hadn't seen or, or hadn't um, thought about. I wanna thank you for that. I do have a question and it's shorter than those two points. Um, I've often joked with people that Wolf is very hard to argue with. And I think what they think I mean is that Wolf is always right. So she must be hard to argue with it, but that's not what I mean. Um, and I think you've encapsulated it in the, I, the point about Wolf's provisionality. And I was wondering if you could expand a bit about upon that notion of the provisional position that she then, um, and why it is maybe we're all, always eager to sort of latch onto those positions and maybe make them a bit firmer than they actually are. Yeah, and I, and I often worry about that with my, my own work um, that, you know, I want it to be um, uh, firmer and more assertive and uh, trying to remember all those writing lessons about not using passive voice and <laughs> using active verbs and things like that. Um, uh, I, I, I think too that, that maybe that's one of those things that's, <clears throat> that's simply changed with time. I was thinking about that in relationship to Peter Stansky, that, um, that need we have for authors we love to always say the right thing and take the right positions. And um, uh, and then maybe finally growing into a little bit more forgiveness um, and, and acceptance and realizing that um, perfection really isn't possible and um, that's okay. And that that's 
part of what we need to share with students because when they when they show up they are often in that developmental place where it's this or this um, and um, it takes a long time I think now looking back to to really get to the place where you think okay well it just keeps going. I think the other thing that um, I've gotten, I've picked up from reading the essays, it, you know, we have that great image at the end of a room of one's own of this procession. And I'm, I'm finding that in other places, this idea of a procession that you just take, take a place in it and you do your work. Um, and people will come after you and probably change it all. And th that's okay. You're in the procession. You know, you're in the procession. Even with an obscure life, you're there. Yeah. Thank you, Beth. Alice. Beth, we adore you. <laughs> and we are deeply in your debt. Oh, wow. Your presence, your in intellectual heft. And I want to give an anecdote, which I know I've told you personally many years ago, but I want to contribute this to the entire community. Um, and your comments about procession are ironic because in two minutes, I was supposed to be in a lineup outside Memorial Church for Stanford graduation. Oh dear. Kind of hold down the road because I wanted to wait to say this, but there was a moment in my graduate education and I was sitting in the Bodleian and I was entirely lost. I couldn't get traction. I didn't know where I was going. And I happened to call up the whole contention between Mr. Bennett and Mrs. Brown. Oh I did not know who you were. And as I read your analysis and your revisitation, it gave the texture and the voice and the sound and the explanatory power that I needed at that very moment. And I knew then that there was continuance and things would work out. So um, I was oh, most oh, startled oh, a year or two later when you were running the Wolf Conference and your name was on that brochure that showed up in my pigeonhole. <laughs> I got to meet you and you were real, you were alive, you were a person. So um, this is all to say that I am about to bolt right now. <laughs> but I want to affirm how much you have meant to this community and how much your work has longevity and resonance and ongoing power. So thank you, Beth. Oh, thank you, Alice. <laughs> <laughs> Shiloh, please go ahead. Oh, oh boy. Okay. Um, I kind of in the in the same vein of of what Alice just said. Um, I am a, a relative newcomer to the Wolf community. My first conference was was 2019, mm -hmm. and so um, it seems like you've been here forever, Shiloh. Thank you, Beth. It really does. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, this is not the place for me to talk about what this community has meant to me in this in these in these intervening years, but it has been tremendous. So, um, but I've been thinking about the salon, and I've been thinking about um, what we're trying to do there, um, what we model there, um, and I'm thinking about the spirit of generosity and joy, and trust that was in that room last night, and then that you were a part of. And I'm thinking about how we acknowledge our our debts, and. Um, I met Ben in 2019 at a round table on pedagogy that you had organized and participated in. That's the first time we met. That is how we connected. That is, I think, how we both knew that we were maybe sympathetic in many of our inclinations. And um, I just, there's something about that that I think whatever happens at the salon, you are already internal to. And we don't always necessarily get to see, you know, what our legacies do. But every time somebody says something about how wonderful this community is, or how exciting the salon is, or how good it feels to be there, I think it's because your pedagogy is internal to almost everything that happens there in so many ways. Um, so that's just me saying. Thank you. Thank you, Shiloh. 
And you're all so very welcome. You all make it very easy, you know. <laughs> Andy sure know how to close down a salon by picking the exact right poem to read when we're all feeling like wild and fired up by Drew and just like bringing us, bringing us back. Like it's, yeah, it's skill. I, sorry, I had to, I had to run <laughs> to another Zoom room and come right back. So I missed most of what Shyla said. <laughs> I, I need to make, before people start to disperse, we are, you're welcome. We have a break before the theater performance of mm, half an hour. Oh, so people are welcome oh, to stay um, for another 28 minutes. Uh, <laughs> but um, I really want to make sure I say this announcement before anybody leaves to go take a break, which is that to get to the theater performance Zoom room, you need to click on the time of the, where it says the time and theater performance, not the title of the theater performance. The link okay. is just in the slightly wrong place. And we, okay. our efforts to correct it were not uh, responded to quickly enough by the IT department. So, so uh -huh. just that to tell you that. And that will start at um, at two thirty, I believe, or one thirty or something. Go ahead, Paula. Oh, thanks, Beth. I just want to say how much I have always enjoyed how real you are. That you tell <laughs> fabulous stories about <laughs> your life, and your father, and just all of that. And I think that's so rare. In um, I mean, wolf people are different from other scholarly people. I get that, but it's even rare in wolf circles that we get to hear people's stories in public. So I really appreciate that. I wanna thank you for your, your openness and just for being 100% on the reality scale. Yeah. <laughs> and I didn't know until today that we were in college at the same time and very close to each other because I went to Kent State and you were at Mount Union. Oh, God, you were there. Yeah, we'll have to talk. Yeah, we will. <laughs> Anyway, thank you. No, not only thank for your you, brilliant, Paul. but for sharing your, your real self with us. Thank you, Paula. I feel the same way. Mm. I'd also I like to jump. I'm not going to be. No, able Alyssa, to talk. yeah, I'll shut up. Never mind. Right. Alyssa, go. I, I'm finding it hard to talk without crying, but. I, <laughs> You know, I fell in love with the Wolf Conference. I wasn't a Wolf scholar. I came to one conference. And I thought, this is why I became an academic, is to be with these people, you know? Uh, yeah, and, yeah. You know, and, uh, and you're, the reason we're all crying is that your talk epitomizes this. It's, it's like this wonderful summation of the ethos uh, that, that lives in the Wolf community, like what Mark said, you know, as a, as a wolfie in my my country is the wolf conference and, uh, <laughs> and i wrote in the comment i wrote something about trusting you to be able to retie our heartstrings oh, and that's how i feel that. it's like it's like oh i'm <laughs> i'm, I'm recentered i i remember why i'm here and what's it, what it's all about um and the sweetness, I mean, the sweetness. I can't, I wish I were a fly on the wall when you read the chat, because you're just gonna dissolve. <laughs> but uh, anyway, I gotta stop. <laughs> oh, Alisa. Sorry. I think, um, actually, Beth, you do want somebody to be with you when you look at the chat. <laughs> okay. yeah. You'll need a hug Scary. and you might need a box of Kleenex. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Because um, Alyssa and the rest of us are all tearing up. So that means you will as well. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> I'd like to reiterate something you'll see in the chat too, Beth. Um, and we've been talking a lot about how much you mean to us. And I think that matters. And I think it, that that isn't just because we like you and you're nice. It's also because <laughs> we've learned a lot from you and because of your research. Um, and a lot of the comments in the chat speak to um, the way in which you give us a vision of Wolf, I think very few of us have, which is someone who's able to move across one of the biggest chunks of her writing career, her essays, in ways that I can't, 
right? I, I focus mostly on the common readers. I couldn't possibly do what you do. And I think very few of us could. Well, and I have you, to keep going back. <laughs> yes, <laughs> well, I imagine there's a lot of material there, but I think I just want to, I want to, in addition to the, the sort of saying how much you've meant to us in this community, it's not just you, it's also what you've wanted to know about, what you've taught us, what you've discovered, mm -hmm. what you've made and remade in every conference paper and every essay and culminating in um, the projects you're publishing now. Uh, I think we we are eager to read them, Not again, <laughs> not just because of how much you've meant to our careers, but because we you have so much to teach us about who Wolf was, even though a lot of us seem to know a lot about Wolf already. And um, I just wanna thank you for that, um, for that knowledge work and to sometimes encourage us to seek value uh, in surprising places in uh -huh. Wolf's life and work. So thank you for that. I'm just thinking about how I have this deadline <laughs> for the second book, which I cannot possibly make. <laughs> I hope nobody from Edinburgh University Press is here today. <laughs> Amy will because, kick them out if they are. Yeah. Uh, because that's one of the first things I'm going to probably be doing. Uh, around about July 1st, I was just looking back at that <laughs> schedule I had set out and thinking, oh dear, what was I, what was I thinking? Um, because as I've told several of you, um, <laughs> actually finishing a book after you think you've finished it <laughs> turns out to be <laughs> a lot of work <laughs> that, that you, it's it's a lot of work that you're not used to doing and so it it takes a lot of time so um i thought i was going to be well into back into the to the sequel and of course i haven't i mean i looked at it a little bit for this but i haven't written uh, another word since months ago so yeah <laughs> Uh, and I, you know, Ben, one of the things that uh, occurred to me is, um, you know, when when you're um, when you're when you're wrestling with criticism or trying to figure out what somebody is saying and where you stand in relationship to that, or um, I don't know, going going back and forth amongst critics. Um, I always have to remind myself, go back and read some Wolf. <laughs> Sit with the essays for a while and read some Wolf. And I think it's, it's like Alyssa said, she always reminds me what's important. She helps me get grounded in, um, exploring what I think and not getting totally overwhelmed with what other people think, even though what they think is wonderful. I mean, it's, it's amazing stuff, but you just have to at some point think, you know, well, okay, but where do I stand? And, um, and it's always about going back to the primary text. It's it's always there. Yeah. I'd, I'd like to just probably <laughs> I'd just like to say a few words. So Beth, um, Beth was the first person I invited to give a plenary address. And um, it was because she made a Zoom visit to my class, which was hybrid in the spring of 2021. 
And it was, um, it was such a moving visit that you had the whole class in tears and me in tears and <laughs> I mean, intellectual tears, right? Mm -hmm. I was in tears because of a kind of recognition of the kinds of thoughts and values that are most at my core in what you were saying. And, um, and I knew that I wanted to do two things. I wanted to let everybody else hear what I had heard and what my students had heard that day and be moved in the way that we were moved. And I wanted to shine a spotlight on you. And um, because of your ideas and your intellect and because of the element of um, what Matt Paula and other people were talking about, the combination, I think that we, we teach with our being. Yeah, we do. <laughs> you know, our, our words are not as important as our way of being. And, you know, this conference is very, very personal for me. This is a sort of a expression of my deepest intellectual and spiritual and moral commitments, I guess. And um, you're a really, you're, your kinship with me is a really, it's just, it, this plenary was the most incredible intellectual gift I've ever received in my entire life. So um, thank you. And thank you. And, and to be able to, the, that you've given this gift to this conference and to this community and for all of us. And to me, this has been an unbelievable weekend of, um, Shiloh and I have sort of texted back and forth. Uh, I'm crying again. I'm crying again. <laughs> <laughs> and so many of these. Uh, yes. And it's, you know, the, the, I, I have seen more and heard more amazing papers and, and rich, real, nourishing conversations at this conference than I've probably ever heard in my entire career. And that is, um, the, the 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 what you have all brought is is just stunning it's magical and um everybody who has who and so many that i haven't heard yet that i just know i'm just i'm just immensely grateful to all of you and breath beth you have just brought it all into focus for making something different possible for making something different together there you go. There that you I go. dream of in yeah. academic life. And the whole reason I got into it and sadly doesn't happen often enough. And to be making that with you is the triumph of my academic life in this, you know, it's just unbelievable. I mean, it's more meaningful than publishing my book this year. It's just, um, so I just wanted to say, that and I know I'm sort of <laughs> bumbling, but <laughs> yeah. So thank you. I'm very happy that we are. This is our final plenary. I'm, I'm just coincidentally <laughs> that we scheduled that way. That way. Although I, I did think that you would be a really fitting plenary, and 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 I and I'm very very. I am very. I want us to look forward. We have more coming. We have. A, a, we have a. We'll be a, crying a, again. Yeah, I mean. Ellen and Kathleen and, and Drew has been working with them to make this um, original, you know, they've just written this original piece that we're going to see performed in 15 minutes. And then Vara has, you know, who has been a mentor and a friend to me from the very beginning, welcoming me and making me feel that I belong here, has organized um, an incredible celebration of the 100th anniversary of Jacob Room celebration and then the wolf players society players and a celebration so I really hope that you all stick around um and yeah just continue the party thank you save that chat Beth
maybe we should take a maybe we should take a, a few minutes think, break and reconvene I, back in the I think we need to do that. Yes. Thank yeah. you, Beth. Reconvene. Thank you, Amy. Thank, thank you all. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. We'll see you in the play. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, everyone. Thank you, Beth and Amy.